All right, everybody. Today I have with me Mr. Larry Sharp. Uh, Mr. Sharp is a businessman, uh, educator, former United States Marine, and was 2018 candidate for uh, the governor of the state of New York on the Libertarian Party ticket. Uh, how are you doing today, Mr. Sharp? Doing awesome. Please call me Larry, not Mr. Sharp. It sounds too silly. If anyone cares about me, they'll Google me. It's Larry Sharp. Google me. You'll find all my background. Ask uh, me what you really care about. All right. Well, yeah, a lot of the stuff was going on um, has to do with uh, things that have been going on in New York lately, especially with yep. uh, your your favorites, um, uh, King Cuomo, as you call him. His Majesty but, King Cuomo II. All hail the king. Yeah. But, but, but first of all, at least just very, very briefly, um, do you think you could uh, tell us a little bit about your background and what first drew you to politics in the first place? <sighs> yes, fine. Um I don't want to leave New York and New York sucks. So I wanted to fix it. New York is an amazing, beautiful state that has so many great things, mountains, trees, sports teams, opera, beaches, uh, falls, farmland, sports, culture, history, you name it, whatever is your thing. New York state has it seasons wineries breweries whatever's your thing new york state absolutely has it we love our state we hate our government our government has ruined our state people are leaving our state like there's no tomorrow and they in theory shouldn't be because everything's here for you the problem is it's so oppressive that new york state literally breaks up families you can't afford to retire here you can't afford to raise kids here so you leave so we educate your kids and then you go someplace else and it's a terrible situation. We have to fix it. Okay. So in 2018, you ran a long shot campaign for governor of New York. Um, I did. You, do you think you could tell me a little bit about that experience and despite not winning, uh, do the results of the election make you optimistic about the future as far as libertarian politics are concerned, especially in New York? Um, no. And yes, that's a, that's a double question. I learned a whole lot. And I try to tell people what I learned, but most libertarian candidates don't care about what I learned. So they don't ask me, they don't ask for any help. They don't ask for my advice. They just run and think, um, it's cause I'm more principled or I yell loud or whatever they think it is. It has nothing to do with that. It's heavily based upon money, which I didn't realize until I ran. I realized it was about money. I had yeah. no idea how much it was about money. I just had no idea how much it was. One of the things I learned was, you know, that I, I wasn't in polls and I thought, well, why wouldn't I be in polls, right? I am. I was nominated by my my party. I was an official candidate. Um, I raised money. I raised a half million dollars, right? That's real money, right? Compared to my competitors, I mean, they raised like four million and twelve million. So no one near my competitors, but that's real money, right? So of course they're gonna put me in the polls. No. So we asked them, why aren't you putting me in the polls? They were very forward. You don't buy the polls. Buy the poll, we'll put you in. It's like, okay, great. How much the poll cost? $40,000. I don't have $40,000. That's one-tenth of what I raised. I got to put that into one poll? Didn't make any sense. So cash is a big deal. You can be the smartest, savviest, most good-looking guy in the world, which I am the best-looking. That's true. <laughs> but besides that, right, it's not going to get me in a poll. So then I said, okay, polls are – I can handle not being in a poll. Fine. Here's what I'll do. I will get in the press because that will work because I'm a real candidate. And I'm kind of funny and exciting sometimes, too. So, hey, look at that. They'll put me in the press, right? And they wouldn't. And we asked them, why are you why are you not covering me? You know what they said? Why don't what? you buy ads? You don't buy ads. Buy ads. And we'll put you in. And literally, I t when I told some people will ask, and I'll tell them how it works. And a couple of local candidates actually did that. They raised enough money to buy ads. And this is literal. When I'm saying this, I'm going to tell you this is literal. Once one person, the salesperson left, he said immediately, let me introduce you to our political reporter. That actually happened. Like, oh, thank you for the check. Here is now our political reporter. So is, that, is, that around, is that around the yes. time you started you started your radio show then? Because I understand you have a radio show too, right? No, so I, I have, I've had a, some form of show for about uh, 13 years in some oh, way, okay. shape, or form. Um, but it's been very different. It's been, a, it's been a business show or a culture show. But the current iteration that I have now, which is Sharply, which is a video podcast every evening around 7 or 8 p.m. Uh -huh. Eastern, 
that one is about a year and a half old. Okay. And that and so one you is, started that after, I'm guessing you're absolutely uh, you're yes. Okay. I started after because I didn't want to lose momentum. I wanted to make sure that it matters because the most important thing in running a political campaign is being popular. And I know that sounds silly, but it's elections true. are literally a popularity contest. It's not about you have the best ideas or the best this. I know some people listen like, what, Larry, what are you kidding me? It isn't about policy. It is about policy. It is. But it isn't about rhetoric. It is. It's about those things. But if those things you're using aren't making you more popular, then they don't matter. Those are means to an end. The end has to be you're popular so people will vote for you so you can make change in your local area or your nation or your county or your state. So I think all those things are important as long as you're using them to be more popular. That's critical. So I didn't want to lose the popularity that I had. For if anyone's listening or watching who voted for me in New York – I'm going to tell you a quick story just so you will feel better. It's not changing anything, but hopefully you'll just feel better. In reality, I got a lot more than 100,000 votes. Why? Because the ballot in New York State, which is also stacked against me, which I don't talk about much because I still lost. It doesn't matter, right? The ballot change isn't what made me lose. If I really thought that had made me win, I would be screaming from the the top of the uh, roof, obviously. But what happened was I was the only candidate who was on the second column. Nobody else was. What does that mean? Some of the machines were not programmed to read a second column. Interesting. So that means any anyone who, who checked only me in those areas, in those machines, it was a, a, a blank vote. There were over 100,000 blank votes. Do you, think last, that that was inten- do you think that was intentional or do you think that just is like a byproduct of I think like they crappy didn't. machines? I think it, what, what it was is we told them this was wrong and the ballot was bad. They simply refused to change the ballot. They said, no, go to hell. We don't care about you, Larry Sharp. What are you going to do? Sue us? Bye. They didn't care. The the elections, the Board of Elections in New York State is run by two, the two top parties, Republicans and Democrats. They often go out of their way to make sure that we are hurt or bothered in some way. Oh, yeah. They, they do the same thing with, like, trying to keep uh, closed primary states, too. Like Always. Yes. Yeah. No. And it's, they, it's because it benefits them. And then same with trying to um shut out people they basically it seems like they raise like for instance for presidential debates um they it seems like they raise the amount you have to pull in order to participate each time and i'll give you a remember, worse i'll give you a worse ross comment. perot ross perot back in 92 yep. i remember too yeah i'll give you a, a worse example right here in new york we need how new york state works legally in new york and it's it's very odd for our state but how does it work if your party get to, for your party get access to a ballot you have to get 50,000 votes on the gubernatorial line. It must be governor's line. That's it. Mm-hmm. Literally, Gary Johnson could become president in 2016 and won New York State, and I, we still wouldn't be a party. The only way is the gubernatorial. We could have two libertarian senators. No. The only way you get access to a ballot is our governor's race on that line, 50,000 or more votes. Well, I got that. Then they changed it the next year to 130. So now I lost ballot access. <laughs> so we sued them saying, that's not fair. And they went, we don't care what you think. No, period. Just no, not logic, not explanation. No, you don't know. You're not the two big parties. You don't matter. No. And what's frustrating for so many people is if you are, if you hear people who are Democrats, Republicans, what they will constantly say is things like this. Well, if you guys would just have better candidates or if you guys would run some better people, I hear that all the time. And my response is, it doesn't matter if we're not on the ballot. Like I could be the greatest candidate in the world. If I'm not on a ballot, you can't vote for me. If the press won't talk about me, you won't know who I am. And if the poll, I'm not in the polls, you won't know if I have any value. So those three things are institutional issues that crush third parties. Not just libertarians, obviously. All, any third party, right? It crushes all mm-hmm. of them. Why do you think guys like Bloomberg and guys like um, – who's the guy who, who ran uh, Starbucks? I forgot that guy's name. But oh, those guys. Yeah. yeah. Why did they decide to not run independent? Because it's impossible. The DAC is literally stacked against you. Schultz is the guy's name. Schultz. Yeah, so, that's right. So, and it's like Bloomberg di- Bloomberg didn't want to associate with the Republican Party, even though he's a traditional Republican, yet he runs on a – that he ended up running as a Democrat, which I thought was kind of funny. Yes, he was our Democratic mayor. Exactly right. Yes. I mean, well, wasn't, he, wasn't he a mayor. Republican when he was – Yeah, I'm sorry. Republican yeah. mayor became a Democrat presidential um, 
uh, nominee, hundred percent. So the the story I say say that I said earlier about the ballot is that if you voted for me, you realize that I got more votes than just a hundred thousand. Because the other thing was I was the only candidate who was on the same line as somebody else. So if you and some people didn't know who my lieutenant governor was, so they thought she was my lieutenant governor, and they circled both. Well, if they circled both, mm -hmm. that's a voided vote, and that they were over. There were over 100,000 of those. It's almost like they're trying to make it as complicated as possible and don't tell Correct. people. So they, yeah, I know. It's yes. pretty egregious. It is. So I try to tell people this stuff. I say, look, look for ballots. You know, sue early. Do these types of things that I learned. And sadly, most of the attorneys don't pay much attention to me uh, because they, they don't think these things matter. And I'm like, but now you're going to get your butt kicked because you didn't know these things matter. And then you're going to be broken. You're not going to want to run again. So if you hear me, I'm telling you the problems you have now. The other problems now, even if you lose, you'll still be motivated to make the next step. And that's what I hope. So in that part, I feel disappointed. But okay. the other part I feel better is most Americans, now I think it's most, are unhappy with their political parties. So that's a positive thing. And with what, what what's happening right now, right, with podcasts like yours right now and others yeah. this is becoming kind of the underground newsroom so we as third party libertarians specifically but other third parties too we really have we dominate this space right now so we have an opportunity to get to more people and to be more popular okay. the mainstream people haven't come here yet they just haven't it's they just that they, they're still on CNN, MSNBC, Fox. They, 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 don't know, they, they don't know that they want to yet. They just get correct. Gotta yes. Got to give them and, some time. And their skill set isn't here yet either. They don't know how to come here yet. Um. Yeah. So when they figure that out, then they'll change. Now, the closest thing you can find is, you know, certain things are, are, are getting close, like Fox Nation is kind of becoming that. CNN has some podcasts. You so there's, see, uh, you do see that too. To, with, but they're not really there yet. The, with the, and I'm not a fan of these networks, um, really. But you do also start to see that with sort of the trop, the or the the Fox News alternatives, the Newsmax, the, Newsmax, the yep. OAN, um, the one uh, whichever one. There's the one that Trump was considering buying to turn into Trump New. But you see that with these alt, these alternate media, that I think like the the sort of net positive of them is they are undermining the legacy media establishment. Yeah, but what they're doing is they're making a mistake that I made when I first thought of this show is they're okay. simply they're simply taking cable news and putting it online. That's okay. not that's a that's not that's why it's not working. If you if if you ever watch MSNBC or Fox CNN, particularly Fox, Fox spends a lot of time pumping Fox Nation, like a lot of time. Fox understands <clears throat> that they're dying. Yeah. So they are pumping Fox. I mean, every other every commercial break has Fox Nation on it, and they're taking the people who are on the Fox on Fox News and giving them shows on Fox Nation. They're giving people who are like the contributors who pop up on a show and giving them shows on Fox Nation. They're doing a very good okay. job considering you know who they are, but they haven't figured out that. I mean, I'm an old man. I'm in my fifties, and I'm on and I'm doing podcasts and stuff, right? <laughs> so. I had to change my mindset too. My mindset was, I'm just going to do a radio show online. But that's not really what people want. You know they what actually I think want I... a different engagement. The future is a much more dynamic um, mixture, more live. I mean, I th the future is much more uh, of, of, a, of a podcasty, Joe Rogan-y type answer. Now, I, okay. it's not Joe Rogan anymore. Joe Rogan is not our answer. But it's something like that that is going to be our answer. I think the future I, is something like you you grab some guy and and you do a you know a, a a one hour rap session in the middle of the day live. I think that's the kind of thing. I don't know what that looks like yet. I wish I did. If I knew what it looked like, I'd be doing it. But I, I think it's gonna be something like that. That's what like Dave Rubin used to do before he sold out. <laughs> to yes, the, uh... absolutely. Which is which is why you see the people doing it right now. They're not the bread tubers. Do you know bread tube? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, is that con like contrapoint? Bread tubers and... are killing. I was on uh, Vosh's show. Um, really? I was okay. on Destiny show. I'm having a debate with Destiny on Friday on um, foreign policy. Nice. So okay, I'm yeah, gonna, gonna have to catch that. I wasn't aware that. I, you, uh, oh yeah, look, I saw what was happening. 
You know, I don't need to go on Tom Woods again. Anyone who, who, who watches Tom Woods already knows who I am, and I'm already on a yeah. show, right? So I'm not preaching to the choir. The one thing you see me do constantly, if you pay attention to what I'm doing, is I'm talking to people who are not libertarians constantly, mm. right? My show, Sharp Way, you mm. rarely find a libertarian on, on that show. Okay. I had a Democrat from New York City on last night. Okay. It is rare because I want I want the left and the right to see us as human. And I want us, people who watch my show, to see us as humans. Yeah, That's because like I noticed, piece. I noticed a lot of things. Like you talk to a lot of people on the left, they'll take like libertarians and will think they're on the right, and then vice mm -hmm. versa too. Like you'll talk to not even necessarily a um, somebody from, as I call, conservative ink, but you'll talk to some like somebody who's more on like the reactionary right. They'll be like, "Oh, libertarians yep. are all a bunch of leftists." Yes. Um, and yeah, and I, I hang out, I, I drift around all of these spheres and I have friends in like kind of all of these groups. And it's kind of like, I think they're kind of misunderstanding where like, yes, where it comes if from. someone is a hardcore conservative, the first thing they'll say, they'll only say two things. The first one will go, you libertarians open borders. They'll go right there yep. and then they'll go pro-choice and boom, that's a hardcore conservative goes, you libertarians, you're all just lefties. You just, you just lefties who like guns. That's what the hardcore conservative says. Yeah. And the hardcore lefty says, oh, you, you're, you're just conservatives who happen to be okay with gay people. Yeah, so like it was like, no, I've yes. heard it. It's a, you're either the right will be like your Democrats for low taxes or the left will be like your Republicans yes. who smoke weed. Yeah. yeah, there we go. Yes, yeah. that, that's what they often say. So, yeah, I mean, and, but th there is some truth to that, right? I think we do attract those types into mm. the movement. I think those types do get attracted to the movement. Um, you find a lot of people who are, you know, Republicans, but aren't so harsh on the social issues. Yeah. They often tend to come to us. That's true. They have like the, the Rand Paul. Yeah. I think you do I find that. Example, yeah. and they, they do come to us. And I think on the left, you find people who are like, oh, but I don't, I don't want the government to be so big or I'm not a socialist. I think they come to us. So yeah. you do find some of those, right? It, so, so some of that is true, but that doesn't mean that's what the party is. It's that not makes the end sense. all be all. Yeah, exactly. Yes. But you do see some of those people come to us. That, that, that's an accurate statement. Mm -hmm. But well, the reason why I brought up BreadTube is because I think you asked what the future was. We have to follow that model in some way. And we haven't done a very good job of it. So I'm trying to get my feet into it so I, I'm going to understand. You know, there's another thing is, you know, there is a youth culture in the internet. And there is an older culture on TV. It just is, yeah. right? If you, if you watch Fox News, MSNBC, if you watch those, odds are you're over 50. Right, some people who are younger watch it, but the odds are you're over fifty. If you're mm -hmm. watching the cool guy or gal who was a gamer and now they're a po political person or whatever, the Dead Destiny, good example of that. Think, perfect example. Yeah. Odds are, you know, you're under forty. Yeah. Right. That's the odds. You're under forty. So there's like that over fifty and under forty in that middle ground between thirty and you know between like forty and fifty that doesn't know which way to go, right? They're like they kind of like they 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 kind of like Joe Rogan, but kind of don't, right? Like they don't know where to go there. So they kind of like podcasts, but kind of still watch TV. So they're kind of in and out, right? So yeah. I think that's the transition that we have right now. I think right now the, the liberty movement has not yet made a good transition into the internet, but we're getting there. We're better. We're way better. Okay. The mainstream has done nothing that comes even close to bread tube. So uh, next, th there is a um, mayoral race going on in New York City at the moment. Uh, mm -hmm. Would you care? Would you care to weigh in on that? And are there any candidates? We have as, any candidates that stand out for you? And if that is the case, you want to make an endorsement? <laughs> we have right now a libertarian candidate. Uh, her name is okay. Stacy Prussman. Uh, okay. If you want to check out what she's talking about, she is Prussman for mayor.com and she is you know up against it the odds of her winning obviously are slim libertarian in new york's in new york city but she actually has a chance okay. so the republican has no chance the they're outgunned about six to one democrats republican in new york city i'm not joking six to one outgunned so the republicans are just not going to win um they're basically the, sacrificial lambs no, uh, usually what they in. do it for, why, why Republicans run, this is important to know, this also works for many gerrymandered districts that people should understand. The Republican doesn't run because they expect to win. They run to become a bit more popular for their next run. 
So say, for example, someone lives in the Bronx, as an example, and they run as a Republican. They're running in a, in a Republican because they think that maybe in the next city council race they can win or they can win a congressional seat or something like that. So okay. they run to become popular, raise money for the next run. That's that, why that, that, that's exactly why you saw. I feel like a lot of the, you look back at the uh, 2019 Democratic debates, how there were like 30 or something. And a bunch of them were people that like he never even heard. Like, who's that one guy? That the Salwell or Swalwell or that, that, that guy's guy. a congressman, though. Exactly. You, you see them, and it's like, okay, what do they want to do? People like that. They or Beto O'Rourke. It's like, no, they want to yep. be sen- They want to be senator next. They want a position in Biden administration. They want um, absolutely governor, maybe something like Kamala that. Kamala Harris is the VP because she was on a debate stage, and she wasn't even particularly popular either. No, was, Democrats uh, hate her. Yeah. Democrats, hate, everybody hates her. She's a Nobody. terrible person. She's a bad person. Kamala Harris is a bad person. She locked up black people, her own people, knowing it was wrong, did it aggressively, and now pretends like she didn't. That's a bad and person. Then, and, and then laughed on like a, po- a podcast for like smoking weed and listening to Snoop Dogg and call it and just like, and she lied about that apparently too. <laughs> yes. So if you're to your point, you're exactly correct. If she wasn't on that debate stage, she's not VP. She's some hated AG. So or maybe still Senator, maybe, I don't know, whatever, but she, that's all she is. Right. Look at Swalwell. Swalwell just wants to make sure that he doesn't get primaried. So if he just yells and says, Trump evil, Trump bad guy, he yells orange man bad, all the Democrats clap and go, no primary. That's all he cared about. So that's why they do it here in New York City also. But there's a big but here. No way are Democrats going to vote for Republican. But Democrats might vote for a third party. It does happen, right? There's There was only 7,000 registered libertarians when I ran for governor. I got probably about 200,000 votes. So a lot of Democrats, Republicans voted for me, right? So they will do it. If Stacey does well enough in New York to where she gets in the debate stage, if she knocks out of the park, she's got a chance. That's the issue. Get in the debate stage, knock it out of the park in the debates because how it works in New York City, if you don't know this, New York City is very odd, as everyone does know. But the first part is New York City, if you're able to raise $250,000, a quarter million dollars, from a 1,000 separate New York City residents, you know, total, then the new the city will give you eight to one matching funds. So the city will literally write you a check for $2 million. Here's $2 million, go run your campaign. So if she can make that, she's going to have big cash and be able to run a real campaign. But more important than that, I think more important than that, how New York City run, uh, works is if you take the money, you must debate or you got to give the money back. Okay. That's how New York City works. New York State does not work that way. There's a New York City rule. So that means there will be a debate. It'll be in October. And we have Andrew Yang running for mayor. If we're lucky for us, for libertarians, not for the city people, if we're lucky, libertarians, Yang will win the Democratic primary. If he does, that debate will be national. Why? Because it's Andrew Yang. Exactly. And we, and we will get a libertarian on the stage in a national debate. That we couldn't get our presidential, we couldn't get our gubernatorials, but we wound up getting a New York City mayor candidate on the debate stage. So that's what I'm hoping will happen. If that happens, she has an actual chance at victory. And then plus, I mean, and then even if you look at, like, even if you look at it like this, even if she does lose, I'd much rather have uh, (laughs) Yang than, oh, who's the guy they have now? Um, What do you mean, de Blasio? De Blasio, yeah. Oh, Oh, I mean, the one of the worst mayors we've ever had. Yeah. I mean, even Cuomo doesn't like it. Well, there's a reason why they don't like each other. Though. Remember something here. There is a there's a rift in my in my state for two reasons. One is just the left right within the Democratic Party, right? The far left versus the more moderate Democrats. That's battle one. But battle two is de Blasio is a true believer. That guy really believes like, you know, I know I took 60% of your income, but if you just give me 80%, then we'll have that socialist you know, utopia I've been talking about. Okay, maybe 85%, then I'm sure socialist utopia. Okay, 90%, no more, 95% is the max. At that point, we will have a socialist utopia. He believes that, like that's in his heart. That's in his head. Cuomo, my governor, 
He doesn't care. Cuomo is a Cuomoist. He would be a Republican. He would be a Libertarian. He'd be a Green Party. He'd be whatever, whatever it is. about power for him. That's it. Just power only. And That's you, all you also, he cares about. You also take a, a take a look. I mean, especially with a lot of, and you see, especially like the, the north northeastern states uh, too. It, it's basically um, political aristocracy at this point. Cuomo is an unelected leader. Like, I mean, yeah, he gets the vote, but he's basically, he's basically a sec, he's an aristocrat, basically. And, it, and he married a yeah. Kennedy. Did he really? I did not know Yes. That. His father was governor of New York. Yeah. And he married a Kennedy. So, and I you're mean, at, yeah. yeah. And yeah, it, that's, why did I call him king? He is it's literally true. aristocracy. But so, uh, for years And we you have, have a bridge named after his father. <laughs> But for, so, for, yeah. for years, you've been very critical of uh, Cuomo, uh, who's your, yeah. who, of course, you referred to as King Cuomo. Yes. <laughs> um, but it, in recent months, it's uh, come to light that uh, Governor Cuomo has a history of sexual misconduct. Uh, did this come as I've a shock? I've been talking about it for years. Surprise. This come as a, so this didn't come as a shock to you. So. I literally said that. I said he's a bad guy. I've, I've said it before. He's a bad guy who will take advantage of people. He's a big bully. That's what I've been saying for four years. Yes, I'm not surprised at all. I'm just like, told you, see, told you. Is there anything you want to weigh in on that in particular? Do you think? Yeah, that's it's not going to affect him at all, at you all. Know, okay. Everyone outside is like, oh my God, Cuomo's finished. No, he's not. No, and I said it then. Like I said this months ago. I was like, guys, stop. He's, he's fine. He's not going to resign. He's not going to be impeached. He's running again, and unless he's an outsider, he wins again. And everyone's like, no way. He's nope. And what do we see right now? We see him right back doing his daily briefs. We see him talking about COVID again, not scared of anything, right back in action, 100%. What I thought was also pretty ridiculous is I heard, I, I mean, it, it was something along these lines. I don't know if this is exactly how it was, but in order to get more votes, and I laughed when I found this out. So there's like already a party in New York called like the Women's Party of New York. And then he started a party called the New York Women's Party um, that would help him get more on the ballot. And then he purposefully came up with that name so people would confuse it with the name of the other party. Oh, that makes just, sense. I didn't know that, but I, that makes total sense. But it was just a yeah. party just to get him more votes. And that's like, I was yeah. just thinking that is the scummiest yeah. thing ever. It was like, especially uh, because of yeah. how little he cares for women. Too, yes. He's, yes. Oh, he's terrible. Um, I, how New York state works, which is really weird. Again, most people don't know this. The city's weird. The state's weird. We have in New York, what's called fusion voting. Okay. Fusion voting means that in New York state, you can actually be on multiple lines. So you can be on, say, for example, the Democrat line and the working families line. So you can literally be listed twice on the ballot. Okay. Right? Three times. Also independent ballot. You could be Republican and conservative and independent. Listed three times. Sometimes you're listed three, four, five times. These parties are just ways of making money and making people feel more comfortable about voting. I remember the the insanely stupid thing that people said was the last last time the election was uh, we had election twenty eighteen the 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 Republican candidate was not conservative he was basically a moderate Republican at best so like a, um, a sort of, Bloomberg kind of type yeah like that I mean literally he's from a purple he's from a purple county um, he didn't even support Trump um, he was a, a very just you know generic and the conservative party said, we're going to teach you Republicans, we're going to vote for him on the conservative line. Holy cow, is that stupid. Like, that is insanely stupid. So now you're just letting the conservatives, who didn't even primary him, who didn't even try to come up with their own candidate, nothing, you're rewarding their terrible behavior by making the conservative party more powerful when they endorse a non-conservative candidate. Wow, was that stupid. That's the kind of bad things that happen in, in, our, in our state. Or... There'll be, you know, 40 people who are members of the executive committee of a party, the independent party, whatever, and literally just ask people, what do you give me if, if for, to get my endorsement? Well, our party will put a million dollars in your coffers if you endorse Cuomo. Done. They endorse Cuomo, get a check for a million dollars. Like that. They just buy, they buy the line. They literally just buy the line. That's it. Just this horrible stuff like that happens constantly, all the time. Yeah, it's, it, sounds, it sounds pretty corrupt. <laughs> 
It is. Yes. The I see it all the time, right? When it comes to corruption, we are awesome. Like, we're awesome. We're better than California when it comes to corruption. We are great. Now, Illinois is trying to be like us, but their governors keep getting caught, right? So they're not as good with corruption as we are. We are better at corruption. The only state that's better at corruption than us is maybe New Jersey because they've kind of just melded the mob and government into one. So, oh, yeah, I no, mean, I was talking about, oh, what, what was his name? So Chris, maybe Chris, Jersey. Chris, Chris, Chris Christie, I like always joked, like, probably, probably has mob ties. <laughs> and then, uh, even Trump back in the day probably did too. I would not be surprised. Yeah, um, I, I don't doubt it. Yes, I, I, I don't, I don't doubt it. Yes. And so, um, other than corruption, what would you say the biggest problems that you feel your state is currently facing, and what besides the uh, current um, uh, aristocratic administration <laughs> needs fixing the most, and what no, would your so, what would your solutions be to fixing them? The some of the I mean, I, I for those of you who 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 are interested, you can head over to my LarrySharp.com page, which still exists and has all my policies there. But the biggest issue, believe it or not, is actually money. We have a, our budget is over $200 billion. I think 212 now, if I'm not mistaken, $212 billion. Only 20 countries and California have a bigger budget. I'm saying it again. Only 20 countries and California have a bigger budget. That's ridiculous. Texas has more people than us, no income tax. Florida has more people than us, no, no income, income tax. tax. And they both have smaller budgets. In fact, Florida is about half. And that is that's, where every, that's, that's where everyone from New York is moving too. And, yes. it's like, and, and it's like, it must be really bad in New York if people are going to move to Florida of all places. Then again, I'm, that's my least favorite state. So. <laughs> but, but yeah, as somebody who's, who's lived there, <laughs> I mean, no income tax. That's great. But it's like, that must be how bad taxes in New York are then if they're willing to move. Well, it's taxes and other things, obviously, right? So taxes is one, but it's also things like, do I want the freedom to start my life over, right? Whether I'm retiring, losing my kids because they're going off to college, whether I am starting a family. New York is stifling in these things. The paperwork, the, the documentation, the whole, it's stifling. And do I want to do anything? Do I want to start a business? Do I want to own a firearm? All those things. It's it, it, it makes it so you're like, I don't want to do it. Like, I, I would rather not do it. In which case, I'm going to leave. So it becomes overbearing with the way they look at every single thing. And I'll give you an example, which is of our government overreach, which will drive some people crazy. Because of the nursing home issues that we've had. Oh, yeah. I heard right? that. With Cuomo the, sending, the governor, killing yeah, the like governor 20, sent people. people. Yep, he sent people into uh, nursing homes and they died there. And so he now has decided that he's going to blame the nursing homes. It's a brilliant political move. Oh, and he also has the audacity to write a book on leadership too. Yep, 100%. Which I was, yep. made me want to bomb it. 100% awesome. He does that. He doesn't play any games. He's an author and, and got an Emmy. Yeah. Won an Emmy, wrote a book, and made seven figures in the book. Meanwhile, the people working on it were government employees. So I paid the salaries of the people to write his book where he made seven figures. That's what happened. So I, I, where's my cut? All I'm saying is, where's my cut? I put some money into that. I pay taxes. Anyway, so that's what happened. So then um, he decides, you know what? It is the fault of the nursing homes. And he blames them. And he says, see, the problem is these private nursing homes are evil and they only care about money. So now he's decided that he, as governor, can decide what their profit margin can be. They can make no more than 5% profit. My governor has decided that your private business, he can dictate how much profit you can make. 5% is all you can make. Speaking of uh, telling businesses what to do and everything, um, we're currently at what I hope is the tail end of a worldwide pandemic. And throughout the duration of it, New York has garnered a reputation of having among some of the strictest lockdowns and mask restrictions in the entire country. So yep. from, a, from a libertarian perspective, uh, what are your biggest criticisms of how New York handled the coronavirus pandemic? And what would you have done differently uh, had you had a say in it? For those of you who want details, you can head over to my YouTube page, the Sharp Way YouTube page, and look for a playlist that says COVID-19 response, March, 2020. I literally put together 10 videos almost a year and a half ago in March of 2020 
exactly how to handle the COVID crisis. And the sad part is, if you look back and look at it, for what I knew and what we knew then, way better. I was right on almost everything. There were certain things that I didn't know then that we didn't learn until later. But without question, I am like 90% on the money. And the number one thing is you have to ch you would have to change the culture of New York State to want to care about health in general so mm -hmm. that people would care more about masks, care more about, you know, vaccines, care about more, all those things more, number one. Because if the culture changes to care, we will act accordingly, right? We won't politicize a mask or politicize the vaccine or politicize anything. I don't want people taking a vaccine for political reasons. I want them to decide it's the right answer for them or their family, depending upon what you're dealing with, and then take it. If it's not, then don't. That's what I want. I want you as the individual New Yorker to make a decision based upon what's right for you. If you're a you know, 70 year old person who has a pre existing condition, COVID might kill you. You might want to decide to take a vaccine. You're a 16 year old healthy kid who plays football. You know what? Maybe not. Maybe not for you. And I'm fine either way, right? Whatever works. But that's piece one. Piece two is we had to stop with the government's always right with everything. Because once you do that, two things happen. One, you invite conspiracy theories. You invite distrust of government, which means you invite rebellion. But if you instead would have said, you know what? I'm not going to order anyone in New York to do anything. And it's like that, that, that kind of mentality, I feel like is, and not many people talk about this, but that kind of mentality, I think, almost was one of the things that fueled the stuff that went on on January 6th. 100%. Well, there's no would, doubt it yeah. does. Yes, a hundred percent. Yes, all the all the, it fuels QAnon. It fuels everything, right? So if if I as governor instead of saying I'm right, do as the governor says, and if you don't do it, I'm going to send my goons down to fine you thousands of dollars. That's what we did. Instead, I'm the governor. Here's hey, what know, I, I just want to say real quick: that fining people thousands of dollars for going outside not wearing a mask that's basically like i think that that just seems really morally egregious to me because that's like going out and stealing people's grocery money right in the middle of a pandemic no because you're evil and you're killing people so of killing course grandma. i should take yeah. your money you're killing grandma of course i should you're killing grandma or you're a business owner which means by default you're a mega corporation making tens of millions of dollars per year even though you're just a small business owner barely surviving so, no, the logic is you're bad, therefore I get to punish you. You're right what you're saying. I'm telling you the logic of my government is you're bad, therefore I can punish you. And most New Yorkers went, yeah, whatevs. So let me uh, finish this piece. If instead of saying that, I would have said instead, I'm the governor. Here is what I believe is the right answer based upon what I know. I'm going to put that on my website so there's a central repository for information. But I'm also going to allow other people, other groups, to put what they think might be the right answer. So you can look and decide which one makes the most sense for you. Now, we have that now, but it's called a wellness group, a wellness center. And they actually put stickers on people's uh, uh, on, on people's retail stores now. So I would have had that up front in March. Here is what the wellness group says. Here is what I got from the CDC and the FDA. And I'll give you one more. Here is what whatever Doctors of America, whatever, think. Here we go. Guys, pick the ones that you want. I'm also going to authorize other two groups to give you stamps in your facilities if you want. I'm not going to send my goons around to find you. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to send my inspectors out. And if you are following government guidelines, I'm going to give you a government stamp. If you're not, I'm going to walk away. That's it. I'm not going to force you to follow the government regulations. I'm going to say, here are the government guidelines. If you choose to follow them, you get a stamp. You don't. I'm walking away. Good luck. Hope this stuff works. I'll allow the welders to go around, give you stamps if they want to. Up to them. No worries. What winds up happening? By default, within the first two or three months, communities would have looked around and said, who's getting sick and when? Oh, my God. These government regulations work or they don't work or whatever. Mm -hmm. And oh, the ones in the wellness people, they work or they don't work or whatever. Oh, this guy's doing nothing. Uh, oh, my God. It's, grandma got sick. This guy's bad. The community would simply not go to the retail facility. Therefore, the community shuts that facility down. I don't mind a community shutting a facility down. If you can't support your facility, you get shut down. Good for you. I don't have to step in. So now that guy or gal who's running that store, that retail facility, either changes or goes under. Both are a win in my eyes. They'll adjust to their community or they go under. I don't have to shut you down. 
But the other thing is, now since I'm not using force, I don't have to double down when I'm wrong. The reason why the government will not say they're wrong is to your point. They robbed people. You can't rob people and go, sorry, doesn't work. You got, when you rob, Once you use force, you have to double down. I wouldn't have used force. So if all of a sudden realized that my stuff was wrong or the CDC lied or if anything happened like that, I just change it. I go, hey, here's the new data. If you follow the new data, I'll still give you a stamp. If you don't, I'm not giving you a stamp, but I'm not shutting you down. Your community will shut you down or it won't. And my data can now change. And I'm not mad. I'm not angry, right? Well, you didn't give me a stamp last month. Well, because the data changed. Data changed, I'll give you a stamp now. That's how that works. If you acted that way across so many things, I mean, that's one idea, but you get my concept. Yeah. Um, there's literally seven or eight different things you have to deal with in New York to make this work better. And I, I detailed them all, if you care, at the Sharp Way YouTube yeah. page. One more question um, before we wrap up. Uh, do you have any future plans to run for office, whether in the next gubernatorial election or for maybe a congressional or a local office? And if you choose to do so, would you run as a libertarian or would you potentially consider running with one of the major parties? Um, let me grab a couple of those. I'm trying to get all those together. Um, I will never run for Congress or Senate or something like that. That's a useless for me to do. Useless for many reasons. One, I don't want to be a senator or a congressman. I want to make impact. And running as a senator or congressman is not going to make any impact for me. Um, I'll, I'll actually lose money, lose assets, make less money, and make no impact. Why would I do that? Now, some people like that. They want to do that. But I'm an executive. That's what I do. I am an executive. So why would I take a position where I'm basically going to be on boards and such? That's, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm you know, I'm going to be on, on, I don't want to do that. It's not, not what I'm going to do. So I would never do that at all. So I picked one piece at a time, which was your question about, you know, Senator or Congressman. That's never going to happen. That's done deal. No. So would I consider running for something else? I would. I would consider running uh, for the governor again in New York. And I'm going to make a decision coming up here in July as to whether I'll do it or not. Depends on what I see. Um, as the landscape. I don't want to run just to run. I'm not one of those guys. A lot of people would like, most runs, sadly, in libertarians is, is really just vanity runs. They don't actually want to do anything. They just want to, I ran for something. I'm super cool. I, I, I don't care about that at all. Not important to me. If I can't make impact, I'm not going to run. I'm sorry. If I don't think I can make impact, I, do, I may be wrong. But if I think I can make impact, then I'll run. Uh, so that's my issue if I'd run for governor or not. Um, so I'll decide this, this summer. Would I run for president in 2024? Very rarely, no, probably no. The only only way I can see it happening is if in some way I am super popular and the most popular libertarian in the country. By 2024, I guess it in theory could happen, but I don't bet on that. I don't think I'm doing it at all. I don't think I'm going to run president in 2024 at all. 2028, maybe. We'll see what happens. I'm still open to that concept, but not 2024. Um, but would I consider a VP slot with a with a with a candidate that can make impact? Yes. If I think that Canada can make impact, I would happily take on a VP role in 2024. If I don't think they can make impact, I'm not going to do it. And that's why I didn't do it last time. I didn't think they can make impact. So I didn't run for the VP last time. Um, I only ran with one candidate who I thought could make impact. So that's all I care about is making impact. Otherwise, I have other things to do. Now, mm -hmm. would I run as with a major party? I would consider doing that only in the fusion situation of New York State, meaning I'm never going to run not as a libertarian, right? I am a libertarian. I will always run as libertarian. But in the case of New York State, I can run as libertarian and get endorsed by other parties. So I would consider that in New York State, as long as I remain li libertarian, I'm not saying I would do it, but I'm open to the idea of it as long as I can remain libertarian. So there's yeah. the critical spot. When you leave New York State, I, I can't do it, right? I mean, you're a libertarian or you're not. New York State offers me that, so I would consider that. Thank you so much for coming on today. Um, of course, uh, Larry. I was about to call you Mr. Sharp again, but uh, Larry's fine. Larry, um, I'd love to have you on again at some point in the future, um, maybe closer to if you make the decision to run for governor uh, sure. go over your platform. Maybe I'd really enjoy having you. I'm sure everyone else uh, who's watching slash listening would as well. Um, but again, everybody, this is uh, Larry Sharp. I will provide his uh, Twitter, his YouTube channel, and link to his website down in the show notes below. Uh, and I hope you have a good day. Awesome. Thank you, sir.